When you're a kid, everything has a happy ending. The Ninja Turtles always defeat Shredder. King Koopa always loses to Mario. You never leave a Disney movie feeling horrible because good always triumphs over evil. That's not to say that bad things don't happen, of course. Characters can die, our heroes can stumble, and reach their lowest point. But I never left The Lion King thinking, Wow, I can't believe Scar won! Despite the horrible tragedy, the bad guy still gets his comeuppance, and Simba restores the Pride Lands to their former glory. And this isn't something to be shocked about. Nobody wants to be depressed, we all crave that feel-good finale that teaches us how goodness is rewarded. A lot of these stories are morality tales, and I think even adults don't want to be reminded of how unfair life can be. But there is something to that. Sometimes it's interesting to see how one character's selfish desire can lead them to ruin. To be confronted with the worst case scenario. And I got to feel my first slice of that when I watched the children's horror show, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Children aren't allowed to watch your Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Streets because of the sex and violence. It's far too extreme, so shows like this and Goosebumps were fantastic. It was a great opportunity for kids to see some unsettling material that kept their minds racing at night. Yeah, it was cheesy, but every now and then, something would stick with you. I vividly remember the Tale of the Chameleons, which really should be called the Tale of the Iguanas, but regardless. In this episode, an innocent girl named Janice manages to cross paths with an evil chameleon that has the power to transform into anyone that they bite twice. It's a goofy premise that starred Tia and Tamara Maori, the twin sisters from the hit TV show Sister Sister. Another part of this curse is that anyone who gets bitten twice by this lizard is now susceptible to becoming one themselves. If they touch a body of water, they will take the chameleon's place. Which is exactly what happens when the evil girl pushes Janice into the shower. Oh god, how horrifying! Janice's best friend Sharon is the only one noticing how strange her buddy has become. Not only has she bought a box of lizards, but now she's eating goldfish raw! What the hell?! Long story short, Sharon manages to trick the chameleon into getting bitten by Janice, which returns the girl back to normal. But uh-oh, they look exactly the same! And uh-oh, they're fighting and spinning around, and now you can't tell which is which! I don't know which one is you! Wait! I can prove that I'm the real Janice! Only the real Janice would do this! No! It's a trick! And so Sharon blasts away, confident in her target, because the real Janice would have no problem throwing those lizards into the well. It seems like all's well that ends well, but then we get one more scene. I'm sorry I had to do that, but I'd make you find the bucket. Oh, I see we left our little friend down there. I hope she knows how to swim. <laughs> I know this show must seem cheesy, and it is, but even still, when I was eight years old, this fucked me up. I was not expecting that ending, and I actually had trouble sleeping that night, thinking about how horrible the outcome was. And it got even worse when the show returned to TV as a rerun. It looked just like me, it was me, Sharon. I think the chameleon wants to be me. Like, Janice didn't deserve this. She wasn't a selfish brat who made bad choices. She was nice to her friend and she had a loving family. And what happened to her was completely unfair. And that's really what makes it so unsettling. On a second watch, you know how it's going to end and it hits really hard. I just look at the transformation sequence and the horror on her face. Her worst fear came true at the hands of her best friend. I couldn't imagine what she was thinking before being sent to her ultimate demise. Are You Afraid of the Dark had plenty of happy endings, and so this one stuck out for being devoid of any hope. You always wished you could jump through the screen and tell Sharon that she's making a mistake. But unfortunately, TV shows only have one ending, and there's nothing you can do 
to change that. But video games? Now that's a different story. Being an interactive medium, it is entirely on the player to ensure the happy ending. Oh sure, Mario is always going to save the day in the cartoon, but in the games themselves, we have to help him do it. And if we're not good enough... That's a halo above his head! Mario is dead! <laughs> Video games have always been about challenge, and game overs are a major part of that. And in the old days, all we usually got was a simple title card. But every now and then, you'd get something fun. Like when you die in Zelda 2, and it informs you that Ganon has returned. Why is that screen so effective? But anyway, as video games evolved and started having deeper narratives, the fail state of these adventures changed as well. I remember the first time I played Banjo-Kazooie for the Nintendo 64. The premise of this game is that an evil witch named Gruntilda wants to be the most beautiful person in the land. Unfortunately, she's a grotesque, disgusting creature, especially when compared to Tootie, the adorable bear cub. So the witch decides to kidnap the innocent little girl so that she can place her inside of a machine that will steal and transfer her beauty. This attracts the attention of Tootie's brother Banjo, who rushes off to save his sister alongside his feathered friend Kazooie. And look, you all know about this game. It's a colorful collectathon platformer with happy music and a dry wit. It's a game for all ages to enjoy, a pleasant romp not so dissimilar from Mario 64. And while, yes, you will ultimately take on Grunty and save your sister, Rare decided to go the extra mile for the Game Over sequence. Because if you lose all your lives, or you just decide to save and quit, there's actually a special cutscene. One where the beauty-sucking machine has reached full power and is now ready to go. Wait, what? I know this ending is kind of played for laughs, what with Mumbo asking Grunny out on a date even though he's supposed to be one of your trusted allies, but even still, when I was 10 years old, it gave me the willies. I wasn't expecting to see the consequences of my failure, to see Tootie robbed of her innocence despite not doing anything wrong. That we actually get to see her as a grotesque monster just does things to my brain. I've always been fascinated by bad endings. It's one thing to imagine something going wrong, but to actually see and experience it is something else entirely. I didn't picture Rebecca Chambers screaming like this. Jesus Christ! Rebecca! That poor girl got her head chopped off! And now Chris is escaping the mansion on his own because all of his friends are dead. Good lord. There's not a lot of mediums that'll just take happy-go-lucky characters and put them in the worst possible scenarios. At least Resident Evil is horror-themed, but why is there an ending where Super Mario drops dead as the world gets covered in overwhelming darkness? I don't know, but I can't look away. So today, I thought it would be fun to peer into an alternate universe where everything goes wrong. Abandon your hopes and dreams because we're going to Sad Boy City to reminisce about some of gaming's most memorable tragedies. Which of course means this video will have lots of spoilers. Listed in the description are timestamps for every game that I'm going to cover, so if you don't want to know how Persona 3 can potentially end, at least you'll know when I've moved on to the next subject. But if you're still down for all this, then welcome. I am the Great Clement. And I'm here to make you think about death and get sad and stuff. So let's start with something relevant. Pikmin! The fourth entry of this fantastic Nintendo franchise has just hit the Nintendo Switch, and it's relatively easy going because it doesn't have a time limit to worry about. 
which you cannot say about the 2001 original. The premise of Pikmin is that an astronaut named Captain Olimar accidentally runs into an asteroid and crash lands on a mysterious planet. There, he discovers plant-like creatures known as Pikmin. These guys are all too willing to help you recover the parts of your spaceship that have been scattered all over with the crash landing. Unfortunately, Olimar cannot breathe on this planet, and if he can't repair his ride in the next 30 days, his life support will go out and he will die. This is an actual time limit for the player, who must gather everything as quickly as possible. Now this game is already kind of unsettling from the very beginning. Since you pluck out hundreds of these little guys, they're very weak and susceptible to nature's elements. They can get eaten, they can drown, they can get crushed, and every time one of them die, they leave behind a ghost as well as a sad little cry. This is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, where you gotta kill a whole bunch of ladybugs in order to survive. This whole time, Olimar is writing in his diary about the struggles of getting off this planet. How he longs to return to his wife and two kids, who are no doubt worried over his disappearance. The days go on and Olimar starts losing weight rapidly because of the lack of food. The stress of wanting to escape is making his hair fall out. It's not an easy fix, and for some players, they won't have enough time. So on the final day, if you haven't acquired at least 25 parts, Olimar tries to take off anyway. And well... <laughs> Olimar's life support runs out, and so he succumbs to the poisonous atmosphere and dies. Later, the Pikmin find his corpse and do what they've always been doing, and drag him to their onion. And it seems that maybe Olimar has been reborn as a Pikmin himself. But even so, who's gonna pluck him out? Whether he's achieved rebirth or not, he's still stranded on this lonely planet. His co-workers, his family... No one will ever know what really happened. It's amazing, and quite sad, how someone can just disappear off the face of the galaxy. But hey, Pikmin is far from the darkest thing in Nintendo, because who boy there is the Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Being a sequel to Ocarina of Time, Link leaves Hyrule and finds himself in a strange new land called Termina. Here, he gets ambushed by a mischievous imp known as the Skull Kid, and this child has in his possession Majora's Mask, a cursed item that grants him some really vexing and destructive powers. The first thing this kid does is turn Link into a Deku Scrub. Why did he do this? Because he could. The Skull Kid has been going ham on all of Termina, poisoning the swamp, turning grown adults into children, freezing out the Goron race, splitting fairies apart. It's because of this kid that a little girl has to keep her father locked in a closet because he's turned into the undead. The land of Termina is not doing so well. But that all pales in comparison to the main event. The Skull Kid has used his terrifying magic to pull down the moon. And when Link arrives, he only has three days to save the world, or else it's going to crash into the planet and kill everybody. Luckily, his ocarina can be used to rewind time so that he can repeat the cycle and figure out how to stop this from happening. But even still, this is a real time limit, and I knew tons of kids who couldn't reach the Skull Kid before the first three-day cycle. So if you can't get to your ocarina in time, the end of the world occurs. Obviously, that's brutal. But it's actually a far more depressing ending when you know the full story. See, before the Skull Kid had found this demonic mask, he was just a little boy who was friends with four magical giants. And then one day, they decided they needed to leave the land in order to protect the people who dwell there. 
But the Skull Kid ultimately felt abandoned, convinced that his friends didn't care about him anymore. Rejection can certainly motivate some of the darker instincts of human nature. And even though he eventually made new friends, his mischievous ways led him to attacking a salesman who was carrying Majora's mask. With ultimate power at his fingertips, the Skull Kid could finally take out his anger on the world that rejected him. These dark impulses twist and change him, leading to the relentless wrath upon Termina, of which his only friends aren't even safe. What's really sad about all this is that the Giants never hated him. They were always his friend, they just had bigger responsibilities to worry about. All the kid needed was a support system, real human connections to lift his spirits and let him know that everything was going to be okay. Alas, hurt people hurt people. And if a hero like Link isn't up to the task, all those people living their lives just get erased for nothing. A wave of destruction fueled by one child's loneliness. <laughs> Video games tend to use the end of the world quite a bit. I mean, who can forget the all-time classic bad ending from 1995's Chrono Trigger? This RPG follows some spunky anime teenagers who accidentally create time portals that whisk them throughout history. At some point, they end up in 2300 AD, where the world has turned into a nuclear wasteland. The cities are destroyed, mutants roam the fields, and humanity is on its last legs. Finding an old computer, our heroes discover that this is all because of an extraterrestrial known as Lavos. In 1999, this creature wakes up from its slumber and proceeds to destroy the world. Faced with the horror of what will happen to the planet, our heroes decide to use time travel to prevent this dark future. It's an interesting premise, considering that our heroes all come from the time period 1000 AD. I mean, they'll all be long dead before Lavos wakes up. But of course, a true hero wouldn't ignore such a tragedy. After all, with great power comes great responsibility. But the fun thing about this game is that you can take on Lavos whenever you want. Yeah, they give you a direct gateway to 1999, so if for some reason you want to try saving the world at level 20, you have the freedom to do that. But of course, it's going to be really freaking hard. And should Lavos defeat you, you get to experience the apocalypse firsthand as your heroes get murdered and the creature shoots nukes all over the planet. But what's most distressing is that final screen. <laughs> When I was younger, this ending gave me nightmares. Lavos's scream is goddamn horrifying! And there's just something about the phrase, But the future refused to change. I mean, Jesus. Gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. And yes, I just said with great power comes great responsibility. Well, chances are you've heard that phrase because you're a big fan of Spider-Man. Marvel's Webhead superhero has had tons of video games, and it turns out that a few of them actually have bad endings. Take for example the 1993 Sega CD game, Spider-Man vs. The Kingpin. I love the 90s! In this game, Peter Parker is just trying to enjoy a night alone with his wife Mary Jane when that dastardly kingpin comes on TV to tell us all that Spider-Man has turned evil. It has come to my attention that Spider-Man has turned renegade. He is perpetrating one monstrous crime after another all across our city. But I never did that! Apparently, Spider-Man has stolen a nuclear bomb and is planning to blow up New York City in 24 hours. In reality, this is the Kingpin's doing, because he wants our hero to face off against his rogues gallery. Only by defeating Doc Ock and Venom and everybody else can Spidey get the keys that will deactivate the bomb. However, at some point, Kingpin also abducts Mary Jane. And so, after disarming the nuke, the final boss fight is against the Kingpin, with Spidey's girlfriend suspended over a tank of sulfuric acid. Now, normally you just thrash the villain and get your happy ending. 
But this is a game from the 90s, and some people might find it a little tricky. And losing to the Kingpin actually has a cutscene. Goodbye, Spider-Man. I'm going to miss outsmarting you. <laughs> and then the game cuts to credits. Yeah, if you actually made it to the end of the game, they don't let you have a second try. Sorry, kid, gotta rebeat the game for a happier ending. Pfft. And even that's not guaranteed. Because this game has a second bad ending. Oh sure, you might not lose to the Kingpin, but what if you take too long? Because during the fight, Mary Jane is slowly being lowered into the acid tank. And if you're not quick enough, she suffers a horrible fate. Mary Jane! My lawyers will have me out by dinner time. Oh, and it's a shame about the young woman, isn't it? You'll pay for this, Kingpin! <laughs> I swear you'll pay! And once again, if you get this ending, you're locked into the credits. Good lord. While Spidey doesn't dial on with her, it's still really bleak that the man failed to save his wife. You figure this failure is going to haunt him for the rest of his life. Especially if he already failed to save Gwen Stacy. Bad ending? Oh yeah, but I do know a guy named Miguel who would argue that this was his canon event. Anywho, this isn't the only game where things go badly for our wall crawler, because there's also Spider-Man Web of Shadows. In this game, Spidey is battling his old nemesis Venom when a piece of the symbiote breaks off his body and attaches itself to our hero. For those unfamiliar, the symbiote is an alien organism that once bonded with Peter, giving him a black suit that enhanced his power. Unfortunately, it also turned him into a complete douchebag, one whose dancing ability is immaculate. As you can imagine, getting reacquainted with the black suit is a bit conflicting. Tell me you don't have that black suit again. Well, it's complicated. You have it, don't you? You know what that does to you. You know how it can change you. You know, it actually worked for me. At first. Maybe this time it's different. Oh, <laughs> that's a slippery slope, Peter. So in this game, you get to decide whether Spider-Man should stick to what works, or whether he should embrace the symbiote. Usually this always amounts to a binary good or evil decision that's about as subtle as a brick. But hey, the option's there, and some players will want to see what happens. Black Suit Spider-Man doesn't care about casualties. To him, the ends justify the means. Also, he might find Black Cat to be a far better girlfriend than that nagging goody two-shoes, Mary Jane. You're right. I could use a little more fun in my life. I promise you, this whole city is yours. Anyway, things escalate when Venom manages to reproduce, infecting all of New York and turning everyone into symbiote monsters. Everything's gone to shit, and only with help from a machine built by the Tinkerer can our hero save the day. But the whole time, Black Suit Spider-Man is going further down the dark side, even ripping Wolverine in half just because he can. This dude has an adamantium skeleton, Jesus. You got some nerve coming down here. You are unbelievable. You like being like that. Admit it. Yeah, I do. It's kept us both alive. I don't know you anymore. The Tinkerer's machine is all ready to go when a symbiote-infected vulture tries to crash the party. Though Spidey defeats him, the old man suggests that things are so much better this way. Why get rid of this organism that only makes them stronger? If Spider-Man were to destroy the machine and Venom, he would be in charge. He could have ultimate power! A noble hero wouldn't listen to this lunacy, but Black Suit Spider-Man thinks this is a great idea. And so, he destroys the only thing that could have saved the world. I promised you this city, and it's yours. I always believed that with great power came great responsibility. And now... I never knew what power was. And that right there is the death of everything that Spider-Man stood for. Those words about responsibility were uttered by his late Uncle Ben, a man who would no doubt be ashamed of the monster that Peter has become. Relying on the suit has completely warped our hero's mind, transforming him into one of the many villains he swore to defeat. I guess the temptation 
was just far too strong to overcome. Which reminds me of a very obscure bad ending that some people didn't know existed, and it's in the Sega Genesis game, Streets of Rage. Streets of Rage is a beat-em-up game centered around three former police officers who are trying to take down Mr. X, the head of a crime syndicate that has corrupted Wood Oak City. This organization is so powerful that it's got its hands in every branch of government, spurning Axel Stone, Adam Hunter, and Blaze Fielding to take matters into their own hands. And really, that's all you need. Walk the streets, beat ass, save the day. And in single player, you'll never experience an unhappy ending. When reaching the final boss, he does offer you the option to join his side, but choosing yes turns out to be a trick. Because instead, he opens a trap door that sends you back two whole levels, making you replay the end of the game just for another chance. It's just a gameplay punishment and has no bearing on the ending. However, this game can be played with a friend, and should the two of you make it to Mr. X, he offers the same question. This time, however, one of you can say no, and the other can say yes. After working as a team for so long, you part company. Now, a fight to the death! So amazingly, this game now ends with a versus match between player 1 and player 2. And if the traitor ends up coming out on top, then they decide to go after Mr. X anyway in order to replace him and become the new big bad. And that's exactly what happens. Instead of your traditional happy ending, our hero becomes the new crime boss, laughing maniacally from atop their throne. Bad end. This scenario is actually kind of genius. <laughs> Who knew that Axel, Blaze, or Adam had it in them? I guess it's like they say, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Staying on the Sega Genesis, I think we've all played something that we found far too difficult to beat. For me, that was Comic Zone. This is a game I actually wish they would try rebooting because the premise is really novel. You play as Sketch Turner, a comic book creator who's coming up with his latest entry when Thunder strikes and somehow gives life to the characters inside. The comic supervillain, Mortis, then enters the real world as a drawing. In order to become a real boy, he needs to send his creator into the comic and get him killed. I don't know how this goofy logic works, but hey, that's the game. The art style was cool, the music's pretty great, you hop between comic panels and tear up pages, everything about this seems so awesome. Except for the fact that it's absurdly difficult. You die in the first level, and that's it. You lose, game over. At which point you are treated to a cutscene of Mortis becoming real with Sketch burning to pieces along with his comic. And now this weirdo is free to terrorize the real world, which I'm sure he'll find is much harder when you can't just draw up silly bullshit. I must have seen this cutscene a million times, because try as I might, I just couldn't beat this impossible game. Why couldn't it be more simple? You know, like Sonic the Hedgehog. Ah yes, the blue Sega mascot that fans of this channel know all too well. Now since the very beginning, this franchise has always had bad endings. But they're not usually something to write home about. You're encouraged to collect the magical Chaos Emeralds because big bad evil scientist Dr. Eggman could no doubt use their unlimited power to conquer the world. In Sonic 1, if you fail to grab these magical trinkets, the end credits will cut to a scene of Robotnik juggling the gems. Of course, you're advised to try again, and when you do grab them, really the only major difference is that Eggman will stomp angrily about his failure. Usually the sequels would add extra bosses and more satisfying endings, but again, collecting them was not always the worst thing in the world. It's still usually just a tiny slap on the wrist, letting you know that Eggman has the leftovers. But there is one outlier in Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Specifically, the Game Gear version. With this entry, Dr. Eggman kidnaps Sonic's best friend Tails and gives our hero an ultimatum. If he wants to save his two-tailed buddy, he needs to deliver the Chaos Emeralds to his Crystal Egg facility. Which is easier said than done! Not only is this game ball-bustingly hard, but the Emeralds themselves are extremely well hidden. 
Seriously, in Gimmick Mountain Zone, they just straight up hide one in a hidden area that you need to jump through a wall to reach. Why would I ever think to do that when every other surface is completely solid? Needless to say, most kids will not collect them. And when they defeat the Silver Sonic in Sleeping Egg Zone, the credits will just turn on. Yeah, you don't even take on Robotnik, you just cut to Sonic running through the fields without his buddy. Eventually, he stops to look up at the night sky, where he sees the afterimage of his best friend. Tails resides among the stars now, because he's gone. I, oh my god, Dr. Eggman killed Tails! Well, that's certainly bleak. Imagine being six years old, having a hell of a time with this extremely difficult game, only to get this downer ending. Thanks for nothing, Sonic 2. And they would do this once again with the 32X game, Knuckles Chaotix. Instead of finding Chaos Emeralds, our favorite echidna must collect Chaos Rings, extremely powerful energy sources scattered throughout Carnival Island. But again, some people may find the special stages to be far too difficult, so whatever, they'll just go through the levels until going face to face with the game's final boss. This time around, it's Metal Sonic, who has been upgraded into a giant red mecha monstrosity. And even though we fight the thing, breaking off its arms and blowing it up real good, we are still treated to a terrifying ending. One where Metal Sonic has nuked Carnival Island into oblivion, presumably killing off Knuckles and the Chaotix in the process. You and your friends are dead. Thank you for playing! <laughs> It just goes to show that even a happy-go-lucky franchise like Sonic can still bum you out with dark imagery. That's no good. Let's continue the trend of mascot platformers and talk about Crash Bandicoot. Now like Sonic, this series requires that you collect some shiny gems in order to get the game's true endings. But unlike Sonic, I feel like you never truly got a bad one. Beating Cortex without the gems in Crash 2 merely has an observation. What do you suppose happened to Cortex? And what about the Cortex Vortex? It's still up there! I mean, yeah, something's off, but Crash still beat the bad guy. Everyone just refers to this as the normal ending, because eventually you'll get all the gems, bring them to Embryo, and blow up Cortex's space station with a big fuck-off laser. These endings don't go horribly, they're just prologues to the true endings which wrap everything up in a nice little bow. Now that being said, this series does have a bad ending. And you're going to find it in the spin-off party game... Crash, Crash. The premise of this title is that the powerful mask deities Aku Aku and Uka Uka have decided to settle things once and for all. But rather than battle each other physically, it is to be a contest of wills. The good guys versus the bad guys in various mini-games. Uka Uka even handing over two of his minions so that it's fair and balanced. So yeah, you pick which of the eight characters you want to play, and then you compete in extremely repetitive activities. The odds of you seeing the bad ending are very low, not only because the game is difficult, but also because the good guy team has all the popular characters. They put Tiny and Dingo Dial alongside Crash and Coco, making it the far more desirable lineup. Who the hell wants to play as Koala Khan? Or Rilla Roo? What Crash game is this guy even from? Either way, being a Cortex simp, I'm one of the few who chose to follow Uka Uka. And if I win all the contests with the bad guys, well, things get really dark. How can this be? Was it so naive of me to believe that goodness on its own could triumph over evil? Now Uka Uka has the crystals. The Earth is surely doomed. Run, Crash. Hide, my friends. Save yourselves. There is nowhere to hide but the rock of the mighty Uka Uka! <laughs> I love how even when faced with the world's inevitable destruction, Crash can still only muster a comical WHOA! <laughs> but yeah, sorry Crash, the bad guys win. Who likes Mega Man? This series doesn't typically have lots of alternate endings, but we did get a bad one with Mega Man X5. 
Originally planned to be the final game in the series, this title had everything come to a head when series villain Sigma loaded up a space colony with his deadly Sigma virus. He then drops it out of orbit, leaving our heroes only 16 hours to destroy the thing before it collides with the Earth. Our heroes have to find pieces for both a space shuttle as well as a giant cannon, all of which are in the hands of eight deadly mavericks. So the player has to defeat the bosses, collect the items, and save the day. But every time you exit a level, an hour will pass, and if you try to use any of the life-saving options without all of their accessories, your chances of preventing impact will be very low. The laser won't do enough damage, leaving Zero to pilot a shuttle and ram the thing with tons of explosives. But if that fails as well, it leads to catastrophic results. The colony crashed into the Earth. The Earth barely avoided extinction. That's right, Sigma almost wipes out humanity and Reploids alike. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the virus also finds its way into Zero, awakening his true persona. For you see, Zero was originally created by Dr. Wily, longtime nemesis of Mega Man's creator, Dr. Light. Zero was always designed as a bloodthirsty killbot, someone who would not stop until X was destroyed. Despite their enduring friendship, which has been a major part of the series since day one, Zero has no reservations about killing his best friend. I'll destroy you, whatever you are, and bring back the true Zero! Their battle is one for the ages, leaving the both of them exhausted and near death. That's when Sigma arrives to finish X off, only for Zero to return to his senses just in time to intercept the attack. The Red Maverick Hunter is destroyed, leaving X by himself to finish the fight. Afterwards, a hologram of Dr. Light appears, and he decides that poor X has gone through too much with this adventure, and so decides to erase all memory of Zero's existence. The game ends with the Reploid struggling to restore the planet, and X no longer remembering his best friend. All those struggles, all those memories, their love for each other, gone, like it never even happened. Instead, X just wants to focus on building a utopia called Elysium, which, fun fact, was a thing in the Mega Man Legends series. Almost as if these endings split off into wildly different timelines or something. Either way, there's not much else to cover when it comes to Mega Man, unless I look overseas because the West never experienced a certain FMV game called Super Adventure Rock Band. Released only in Japan for the Sega Saturn and PlayStation, this game is made up entirely of animated clips. It's basically a 90-minute Mega Man cartoon, where you occasionally have to input QTEs and battle bosses in the first person. The story centers around an extraterrestrial robot named Ra Moon, which crash lands in the Amazon. Dr. Wily goes to investigate and finds himself another useful tool that can help him conquer the world. Generating an electromagnetic field, Ra Moon has the ability to destroy all technology everywhere, and so the mad scientist activates this power, holding the world hostage unless they give him total control. This energy field also affects Roll, Mega Man's sister, putting her in a dangerous position as her life slowly starts to drain. If our hero can't shut down this Ramoon, her circuitry could fry, taking with it her life. So Dr. Light preps our hero and sends him to the Amazon, where Dr. Wily is protected by the usual robot masters. Now this game isn't super hard, but it expects you not to take too much damage, because your health remains the same going from battle to battle. And if you keep failing QTEs, you may find yourself dying rather quickly. Being an animated adventure, they bothered to show what happens when Mega Man fails. お、ロール<笑> 
これで地球は本当にわしのものとなったのじゃオーナムンよ<笑>おまいガーッ、that's horrible! I did not want to see Mega Man and Dr. Light crying over Roll's death! Jeez Louise! And yeah, there are other bad endings as well, like where Mega Man gets blown the hell up. Oh yeah, I'm sure that won't traumatize the children! <laughs> Keiji Inafune has famously disowned this game for its darker material, and maybe that's why Capcom never brought this over to the West. But hey, it's still one of those things where now that I've seen it, I can't unsee it. This ending lives in my brain for all eternity. Man, I gotta take a break from all these downer endings. I gotta play a licensed game like Star Wars Episode 3, Revenge of the Sith. It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! You underestimate the power of the dark side. Don't try it! Whoa, whoa, what the hell? Yeah, in the PlayStation 2 tie-in game, you can choose to play as Anakin Skywalker during the final confrontation. And instead of you getting beaten anyway, they bothered to put in a what-if scenario where Vader came out on top. Which is all the more sad thanks to the extra dialogue. Anakin, please, come back to the light. Face up to what you've done. I can help you! It's too late for that. You're too late. You only want to help yourself. You know that's not true! There's something heartbreaking about Anakin acknowledging that it's too late to turn back. And it certainly is! Not only has he changed the saga, but he's not done yet. There are none left to oppose us. The galaxy is ours now. <laughs> No! The galaxy belongs to me! I like the clone troopers looking around like, uh, should we shoot him? <laughs> but yeah, Darth Vader conquers the galaxy. This series has a lot of bad endings that usually exist because of morality. In Star Wars Dark Forces 2, as Kyle Katarn, you can kill innocent civilians and do skeevy things, which all leans him towards the dark side. And when the bad guy Inquisitor Jarek captures his girlfriend, he offers him a choice. Strike her down and realize your true destiny as a dark Jedi, your true power! Hey, stop laughing at his costume! This is serious! Why do I need you, Jarek, when I can take all the power of the valley myself? Now what kind of asshole would kill Jan Ors? She was the best, damn it! Regardless, Kyle has made his choice, and when he ultimately wins, he becomes the new big bad. Our spies bring word of a small rebel uprising on Danuta. I have no time for petty uprisings. Extinguish them painfully. Yes, Emperor. I want you to remember, son, when you're at the Academy, how very proud I am of you. It's ironic. In Star Wars The Force Unleashed, you play Starkiller, Darth Vader's secret apprentice who hunts for Jedi in order to prove his strength. To show that he's worthy of eliminating the Emperor, thereby securing his master's place at the top of the galaxy. Eventually, Vader has the brilliant idea of using Starkiller to rally the Empire's enemies, thus creating the Rebel Alliance. There is much conflict in you. Your feelings for your new allies are growing stronger. Do not forget that you still serve me. I hate being him. I think he does too. But it's all a trick! Vader never planned on killing the Emperor, he just wanted to find his enemies and capture them. His apprentice is left for dead and the rebel leaders are taken to the Death Star. But Starkiller's not done! He busts into the place hoping to save everybody as well as defeat his master. And he's successful as he kicks Vader's ass like it ain't no thing. Kill him, he was weak. Grover, kill him and you can take your rightful place at my side. No! 
Ah! Help him! Gee, should I save my friend and take out Satan? Or should I go down and finish off a beaten man? Starkiller lets his anger get the better of him and he kills Darth Vader! Afterwards, he thinks he's got a trick up his sleeve, but you can't outsmart the devil. You have betrayed your master, your allies. I knew that you would betray me as well. And now, you have doomed yourself and your friends. No. No! Eventually, Starkiller wakes up and finds that his body has been mangled and put back together inside of a hideous robot suit. Just like his master before him, he is destined to serve as the Emperor's slave, a disposable henchman that will follow orders until someone better comes along. Finish him. Starkiller became the new Darth Vader. Because those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. There is nothing more miserable than being someone's whipping boy. Just ask Abe, the main character of the Odd World series. The 1997 game Abe's Odyssey is set in a very dark and depressing place. A world dominated by capitalism, where big corporations have enslaved a race of people known as Mudokans. Not only are these poor guys toiling away in their factories and mines, but some of them are even getting their mouths and eyeballs stitched together. Good God! Now the Gluckens in charge are short-sighted, so one day they find that they can no longer serve their Meech Munchies because the Meeches are now extinct. Being evil as fuck, they come up with a new food source to satisfy their customers. Mudokens themselves! Yes! They plan on feeding their slaves to their oblivious customers, all in the hopes of increasing their profit. Enter Abe, a janitor who accidentally learns all this, gets horrified, and decides to make a break for it. When he does, it becomes clear that he's been selected by the Mudokan gods to be their chosen one, the hero who will one day bring total emancipation. But still, being a meek and awkward fellow, this character's success is not set in stone. Oh, Bali, nice, you're out of here! Uh, okay, follow me. Okay. But... Ah! Oops, I forgot he was blind. Help me rescue the rest of them. I guess I'll have to, huh, Abe? But yes, you can sneak through all the levels taking out the bad guys and stuff, but what's completely optional is saving your fellow Modokans. Hell, if you push the wrong switches or act irresponsibly, you can get everybody killed! And this affects the ending. Because eventually, Abe gets captured by the bad guys. And if you were being selfish or careless and not doing what you could to liberate your people, then what happens next should come as no surprise. He didn't do much, but Abe, he's one of us. He, did, he wasn't any good. He wasn't really that good. He shot us. But what do you think? He was a schmuck. Well, how about you? I don't get it. Now, boss. No, guys, no, no. No. Ah. no, no. Let him. <laughs> Ooh, nasty. Yeah, poor Abe gets fed to the grinder and liquefied. But this series would have multiple sequels, and I swear, with each subsequent entry, they kept making the endings darker and darker. Like in Abe's Exodus, the Mudokans just straight up hand you over on a silver platter. You didn't save our buddy. But guys, it was harder. And you ain't getting away with it. So Abe finds himself waking up in the clutches of the Gluckens, who are torturing him day and night to make him cry because Mudokan tears are one of the prime ingredients for their new soft drink. That's really messed up. Think we got enough, boss? What the hey? Let us go for the record! Pop it up! No! I'm on it. And then there's Munch's Odyssey for the Xbox. Once again, your neglectful attitude gets you in hot water, where we have to see our hero get his fucking lungs cut out at an operating table. 
I get to see poor Abe stumble and burn to death because everything went horribly wrong. It's a special kind of nightmare fuel, let me tell ya. The moral of this story is that if you're not willing to help your fellow man, then you shouldn't expect any kindness in return. Oh, the PlayStation had so many banger games, and there was another one that involved sneaking around. Metal Gear Solid. Yeah, I'm sure you all know about this one. When terrorists manage to capture a nuclear disposal facility, the American government sends in their top agent to save the day. Enter Solid Snake, the legendary hero who saved the world before by destroying nuclear death tanks known as Metal Gear. In this mission, he's got to save the hostages and dispose of the bad guys, an adventure with many twists and turns that I don't need to go that hard into. What's important is that he eventually crosses paths with Meryl Silverberg, a rookie soldier who was taken captive when the uprising occurred. How oh, just what I'd expect from the legendary Solid Snake. You trying to sweep me off my feet? Don't worry, you'll land back on them once you meet me. The reality is no match for the legend, I'm afraid. Oh, I don't believe that. Now, Meryl is the niece of Snake's commanding officer, Colonel Campbell, and she became a soldier in order to feel closer to her late father. She's a rookie with no real combat experience who finds out that war isn't all it's cracked up to be. This isn't a training exercise. Our lives are riding on this. There are no heroes or heroines. If you lose, you're worm food. But Snake, you're a hero, aren't you? I'm just a man who's good at what he does. Killing. There's no winning or losing for a mercenary. The only winners in war are the people. That's right, and you fight for the people. I've never fought for anyone but myself. I've got no purpose in life. No ultimate goal. Come on. Meryl discovers that Snake is a rather cold, lonely person. Someone so detached, he doesn't want to pursue any kind of love for himself. She believes in him, but Snake keeps trying to bring her down to reality. Well, it doesn't get more real than getting into the crosshairs of a sniper rifle. Meryl, get down! Uh, ah! Meryl! Poor Meryl gets taken out by the deadly sniper wolf, and without any way to retaliate, Snake has to leave her behind. I was a fool. I wanted to be a soldier. But war is ugly. There's nothing glamorous about it. Snake, please save yourself. Go on living and don't give up on people. So Snake takes off, finds a sniper rifle, and returns to find that Meryl has disappeared. It's then that he ends up getting captured by the enemy, where series antagonist Revolver Ocelot attaches him to an electric torture device. He reveals that Meryl is still alive, but whether she stays that way is up to Snake. When the pain becomes too great to bear, just give up and your suffering will end. What if you do? The girl's life is mine. This section is also the only point in the game where dying prevents you from retrying instantly. Instead, you get kicked to the main menu, meaning if you haven't saved in a while, you'll have to redo tons of progress. Also, don't even think about using auto fire, or I'll know. You can't even cheat with a special controller. So if you don't want to redo lots of progress and you're just not that good at button mashing, you'll have to give up. You... you win. So, you're human after all. The torture will stop as I promised. But I'll take the woman in return. I'll have my fun with her before I kill her. Meryl. I hope you can still look at yourself in the mirror, my friend. While he does eventually escape custody, destroy Metal Gear, and save the world, he couldn't save the girl. I gave in to my pain. I sold your life to save my own. I'm a loser. I'm not the hero you thought I was. I guess blaming yourself makes it easier, huh? If you do that, you can keep the pain at a nice safe distance. People die. But death is not defeat. Life's more than just a game of win or lose. Don't you think? Let's live, Snake. Meryl, I hope you're still watching me. Maybe I can prove myself to you after all. Another sad addition to this ending is that we learn from Colonel Campbell that Meryl wasn't his niece after all. She was, in fact, his daughter. 
Something you don't actually find out in the good ending, which is quite the reveal for someone doing a second playthrough. The game skirts with the idea of whose belief was right. Was Snake truly just a cold, detached killer, or was he more of a hero than he thought he was? One would assume that Snake was correct, that Merrill's naive optimism was misplaced. But if anything, I think this reinforces the change that Snake makes in his life. Even by failing to save Merrill, Snake will forever remember his promise. That people can do more. That life is worth living. That even a man like him shouldn't shy away from his own happiness. A lot of people actually prefer this ending. Not because they didn't like Meryl, but because it's very subversive to your typical action hero fare. A sad ending to be sure, and yet it's a hopeful one as well. But what if wanting to live your life could actually be the bad decision? Well, that's something players dealt with when they played Persona 3. The premise of this game is that a whole bunch of scientists tried to control space matter, but only ended up creating something called the Dark Hour. A 13th hour of the day where the world transforms into a dark alternate dimension, complete with tons of shadowy monsters who want to tear things up. Only a bunch of teenagers who have awakened their personas, the living embodiment of their inner subconscious, can save the day. Your character teams up with his fellow students, as well as a sentient robot girl named Igus, who has tiny nub feet that look incredibly awkward to walk on. You also have a dog for a party member, because why not? <laughs> Now they spend every month trying to take out 13 major shadows, hoping that this will repair the space-time continuum and eliminate the anomaly. It doesn't end up working, but it does spurn the appearance of a new student to your high school, a kid named Ryoji. Eventually, Igus comes face to face with this man in the dark hour, where all of his memories come flooding back. No, he's not a teenager, he is in fact the apprizer, the living vessel for Nyx. Nyx is the mother of shadows. In ancient times, she bestowed death to this world. If she is awakened, darkness will once again cover the land and all life will vanish. When? When will it happen? I'm afraid you will not live to see spring. <laughs> what are you guys freaking out about? All we have to do is defeat this Nyx. Defeating Nyx is impossible. It has nothing to do with strength, ability, or power. Just as all living things die, and the flow of time is continuous, Nyx cannot be defeated. Ryoji's words are very shocking. The world is going to end, and apparently there's nothing they can do about it. But the kid offers them a choice. Being the apprizer, he is the only thing keeping the Dark Hour intact. If they were to kill him, all memories of their adventure would disappear, and they could live the rest of their short little lives in complete harmony. No anxiety, no fear, no expectations. They won't even see it coming. A happy way to go out. He then gives them a month to decide, which spurns each party member to look deep down inside and wonder what it is they're fighting for. But amazingly, everyone comes to the same conclusion. Even if it is hopeless, they want to keep fighting. Maybe Nyx is impossible to defeat, but they can't know for sure if they're not even willing to try. But ultimately, the choice is up to you. Don't tell me you've all decided to let me live. You're all going to risk your lives on a battle you can't win. So, you understand. Going against the wishes of your fellow party members, you decide to kill Ryoji. Sure enough, all memory of the Dark Hour and the grand connections you've made disappear completely. Hey, uh, is that girl looking at us? Dude, she's pretty cute. How come I never noticed her before? The only person who wasn't affected was poor Igus, who can only sit there and wait, bracing for all of life to get extinguished. Being a robot, will she be affected too? Or will she be alone in a dead universe? Good God. But anyway, there's really no hurry to decide what we want to do with our lives, right? Sometimes you're better off not knowing. As they say, ignorance is bliss. In the end, it doesn't matter as long as you're happy. <laughs> Let the good times roll. Karaoke, anyone? Let's celebrate our future. The ending, when taken out of context, seems pretty happy, actually. Everyone's enjoying their lives, looking forward to the next year. 
The end credits music is still triumphant and beautiful, and the final shot shows everyone bonding over karaoke. What a game, right? But of course, we know the dark truth that lies underneath. I'm willing to bet that singing karaoke was the last thing these guys ever did. Ryoji did say that it would be instantaneous, after all. Your character ignored his friend's desire to fight back, he chose to live in denial rather than face his problems head-on. You'll always miss 100% of the shots you don't take, and now all of existence is going bye-bye. But hey, at least you died happy, right? You know what makes me smile? Killing a whole bunch of zombies with a Mega Buster. A wacky option that's always available in the Dead Rising series. When someone manages to create a pathogen that turns people undead, some poor schmuck has to navigate a shopping mall filled with these guys. Not only that, but they also have to race against the clock so that they can get to the bottom of what exactly happened. The first game starred Frank West, a photojournalist looking for a scoop. You know how to use this? Kinda. I've covered wars, you know. He ends up crossing paths with the villain responsible, but things still go south depending on how you play. If you miss out on the time-specific main quests, then you're locked out of the true ending. Potentially, Frank can escape just fine, but without the truth, he can't prevent future zombie outbreaks from destroying the country. Or worse yet, he can't stop the bad guy from setting off a bomb that destroys the mall and spreads the virus. He could be left behind, he could get captured by the military, maybe the helicopter guy gets eaten by a zombie. I mean, there's tons of possibilities. This is also the case with the sequel, Dead Rising 2. In the second game, you play Chuck Green, a man trying to take care of his daughter Katie who had been bitten in a prior outbreak. Since she's infected, the only way to keep her alive is to take a pharmaceutical drug called Zombrex every 24 hours. Yeah, it doesn't last long, and as you can imagine, it's pretty darn expensive. This forces Chuck to compete in a reality game show that's all about killing zombies. He has to drive his motorbike headlong into mobs of these guys just to get paid and entertain the bloodthirsty masses. Oh, this universe is fucked up! It turns out when a zombie outbreak happens, there will be plenty of people that embrace their true selves, becoming crazy evil psychopaths. Some of the many unique boss fights that Frank and Chuck have to deal with. Anyway, long story short, a second outbreak occurs and Chuck gets framed for it. So the guy has to go looking for proof that will clear his name and keep him out of jail. Again, very similar outcomes here. He can get captured by the military, he can get shot by the game's secret traitor, but of course the most devastating outcome occurs with Katie. You're not afraid of those bad people outside? Nothing's gonna stop me from keeping you safe, Katie. Daddy loves you so much. Chuck's all out of Zombrex, so he needs to find a new container every 24 hours. If he doesn't, his daughter will succumb to the virus and become the undead. Katie is the most important thing in Chuck's life, and if he loses her, then it's all over. Katie. Sweetie, you okay? Katie? Katie. It's not your fault. We should get ready to go. Yeah, Chuck will just give up, letting the zombies eat him alive because he has nothing left to live for. Losing a child is one of the worst things that could ever happen to someone. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. But now, I'm gonna cheat a little, because I've shown you the bad ending, but now I want to talk about its follow-up. There's this spin-off game, Dead Rising 2 Off the Record. It's basically identical to the original version, except Chuck has been replaced with Frank West, the hero from the original. And with him comes some new content, including a new psychopath who looks awfully familiar. Hey! You get the hell away from my bike! Oh yeah! Off the Record decides to continue on from one of Chuck's bad endings, where poor little Katie has been killed and the biker won't accept it. These zombies. They're annoying, sure, but they're easy to kill. Well, kinda, kinda fun, even. An outbreak like this does things to men. The violence, the death, makes people snap. Just like that. 
I like the mirror that this holds up to the player. A person wearing wacky costumes who takes glee in killing zombies in the goofiest ways? I mean, yeah, wouldn't they be completely deranged? <laughs> Katie needs her Zombrex every 24 hours. Right, baby? Let's get you and your daughter back to the safe house so that... Get the hell away from her. Ooh, crap. You're just one of those nut bars! You just want to hurt her! Keep her from getting her Zombrex! Nobody messes with my kid. Perhaps Frank and Chuck were always unhinged, one bad day away from being the very psychopaths that they keep stumbling into. Dead Rising asks the question, how much would it take to completely lose our minds? And finally, the last game I want to highlight is a PlayStation 5 launch title that's rated E for everyone, and you probably didn't expect that it would get incredibly dark. That title is Bug Snacks. I mean, I remember the first time I saw a trailer for this game. A colorful adventure about some Muppet people who eat bizarre animals that all look like food. Burgers, pizzas, french fries, ice cream, Oreo cookies. The bug snacks are goofy and cute as all get out. You play as a journalist who sent an invitation to Snack Tooth Island to join an expedition team who have discovered the strange creatures known as bug snacks. The head archaeologist, Lisbert, wants to share her findings with the world, asking you to document everything you can. Unfortunately, when you arrive, you find that everything's gone to shit. Lisbert and her girlfriend, Agabel, have disappeared, and the team is split apart because of the tension amongst themselves. You think these walking vegetables are your family? I got news for you, Gramble. Bug snacks will never love you. You don't know a thing about love! That's why your wife left you! Let's all take a breath here and... Don't act like you're in charge! If you had the spine to lead us, everybody would still be here! So as the player, it's your job to use their wacky gadgets to catch all of the bug snacks, solve everyone's issues, and ultimately find out what's going on here. The people on this island are filled with hang-ups, and eating is their only way of coping. But it should be mentioned that when people eat bug snacks, their bodies change into the very creature that they ate. And apparently no one thinks this is goddamn horrifying! Could you imagine just turning into a whole bunch of potato chips? For your arms and legs to turn into wieners? You guys seem way too chill about your bodies transforming like this! Your character is allergic to bug snacks, and therefore will not be joining in the festivities. But anyway, like I said, big time spoilers! This game is rather new, and I don't want to ruin what's a really fun, awesome game for you. I recommend playing it yourself and skipping ahead if you don't know what happens. Okay? Okay. So eventually, you do find Lisbert, and she's at the heart of Snacktooth Island, transformed into this unholy abomination. This is the island's true form. It's bug snacks all the way down. They're parasites. They get inside you and they change you. Your body and your mind. They make you want them, and before you know it, you become them. What you see here, this is what's left of everybody who came before us. Of every living thing that wasn't bug snacks. They always win. You have to get out of here. You have to gather up the others and get off the island. I knew something was off about this place. So the bug snacks get hyper aggressive and start attacking the camp. Normally, you'd be able to fight them off and escape unscathed. But, others may suffer a far more disturbing fate. Because if you haven't been doing side quests to boost everyone's morale, and you've been feeding them way too many bug snacks, this kid's game turns into a horror show. Instead of fighting the creatures off, they'll just keep eating them. I'm such a failure. I couldn't even control my hunger. No wonder nobody believed in me. This is the end, yeah? I was gonna end up here one way or another. Not that it mattered anyhow. Only thing that matters out here is Buckstab. There's no point in going back with them. I don't have a life or friends. Nobody I can really trust anyway. But Bug Snacks, I can trust you to be delicious.
if I can move on. Not when we lost so many friends. I just wish there was a way we could go back and and make things right. Don't you? I was not expecting this game to get so dark. Holy shit. Because if you don't lend a helping hand to improve their lives, everyone succumbs to their depression and just gives up. It's a very extreme allegory for people who eat away their problems, for those who abuse drugs to dull their pain. Some people aren't strong enough, and if they think there's nothing that can be done, well, this is the end result. God damn, Bug Snacks. God damn. So as we approach the end of this video, I just want to say that yes, I know what you're going to type. Clement, Streets of Rage 3 has a bad ending too. Clement, why didn't you talk about Knights of the Old Republic? Clement, what about Persona 4 and 5? You forgot this, you forgot that. Why didn't you mention this? Why didn't you mention that? Look, the video is long enough as it is! There are so many bad endings in video games, I could make a part 2 or a part 3 to this. I didn't even talk about fighting games! You know, in Tekken 5, if you lose the Jinpachi Mishima and don't press continue, there's actually a cutscene! In Street Fighter Alpha 3, M. Bison will take your defeated character and use them to nuke an entire city. Talk about insult to injury. I could have talked about horror games because practically every one of those have alternate outcomes. If you play your cards wrong, the original Silent Hill could be a fever dream. Harry never left the car. This was all his imagination. He's been dying this entire time. In 2009's Alone in the Dark, Carnby can get possessed which leads to the greatest one-liner in video game history. I'm the light bringer! I'm the fucking universe! And I don't even want to tell you what's happening in this scene from Haunting Ground. <laughs> at the end of Cuphead, the devil offers you a place at his side, and you can take it, turning Cuphead and Mugman into demonic versions of themselves. In Mass Effect 2, you can screw up the suicide mission so badly that even Commander Shepard doesn't make it out alive. You have to really go out of your way to know that this is a possibility. Heavy Rain doesn't have a fail state. Every time something goes wrong, the game just keeps on trucking. As you can imagine, bad endings aplenty. The origami killer has taken a ninth victim. The body of Sean Mars was discovered this morning on wasteland north of the city. The officer in charge of the investigation, Captain Leighton Perry, has resigned this morning. Hey guys, you want to turn down the triumphant music? Jesus Christ! <laughs> I didn't even talk about Castlevania games. Those have plenty of bad endings. And then there's FMV games that are all live-action footage just waiting for the player to make the wrong choices. In Myst, you end up inside of a book while not Kevin Smith tears you to pieces. Batman could fail to stop Ra's al Ghul from melting the polar ice caps. King K. Rool could destroy Donkey Kong's island. You couldn't defeat Sombron, so now darkness prevails! Everyone you care about, they are all dead. These are the bad endings of video games. But before I go, I'd like to point something out. This topic was about things going wrong. It was not about dark endings in general. If it were, I would have brought up The Last of Us Part Two, because by the end, things are much worse off than when the game began. But you see, that's the game's only ending. You can't make it happier or darker, it only has the one outcome. Whereas every single example I've given today does have a happy ending. In Majora's Mask, Link can prevent the moon from falling. He'll defeat the demonic entity, everyone in Termina will be happy, and he'll even save the Skull Kid by becoming his best friend. It's genuinely one of the most feel-good endings in the whole entire series. Snake can save Meryl's life. Abe can liberate the Mudokans. Olimar can escape that planet. Roll is gonna be just fine. No matter how bleak the situation, how hopeless one can feel, nothing is set in stone. 
We control our own destinies, and we can make our happy endings come true. It won't always be easy. Things will go wrong. Things will get darkest before the dawn. But if there's anything these alternate endings have taught me, it's that it's still worth trying. How important it is to hang on to one's convictions. What a difference helping others can make. These dark outcomes aren't meaningless. I think they're a wonderful window into our anxieties and fears. An interesting examination of what makes us tick. Sometimes, to do the right thing, you need to be reminded of how bad it could get. And for that, I will always find bad endings to be fascinating. Thank you so much for watching this video. Hey, did you guys know that I'm really slow when it comes to making these things? <laughs> to be honest, it would have been done ages ago, but I was dealing with a lot of technical issues behind the scenes. Ugh. Well, my next project will be a follow-up to one of my retrospectives as I'm giving my thoughts on Final Fantasy 16. So look forward to that, and I thank you once again for your patience. I am the Great Clement. Until next time, toodles. Mm -hmm.